Hi, I'm Robin, and I spent 15 years in the classroom teaching foreign languages, art, and social studies. Now I use my experience to work at WTCI on our show, Raise Your Hand. In the episode that you're about to see, a famous shadow puppet master named Daniel Barash from the Kennedy Center joins us for a workshop at the Chattanooga Theater Center. The history of shadow puppetry begins in Asia, and this profound but simple art form shows us how to tell stories in a multi-dimensional way with simple ingredients like light, paper, and shadows. Daniel shows us the power of shadow puppetry and how we can tell important community stories using this ancient art form. Let's hear more from Daniel about his craft. When I was living in New York about 25 years ago, I went to see a theatrical production, and most of it was sort of as you'd expect, actors on a stage, scenery, props, lighting. But for one scene in the show, the theater completely darkened, and a few moments later, a small screen was backlit, and the characters that had been inhabited by people were suddenly these six-inch rod puppets. And as they danced across the screen, it was really transportive and magical. I think that the art form really calls upon the different learning styles that we find within our classrooms. So whether you're a visual learner and you need to see, whether you're a kinesthetic learner, you need to move, whether you're an auditory learner and you learn by hearing, it really encapsulates and encourages all of those different learning styles to be used at the same time. And I knew that it was a technique and a strategy that I wanted to use in my theater and education work. So I think of shadow puppetry really as a storytelling medium. And there are so many amazing stories within our classrooms and within our schools that just are begging to be told in new and interesting ways. And I think that when you use shadow puppetry, you're really bringing it from the page to the stage in a way that's going to be appreciated both by the students and by the people who are watching. Rita Lorraine Hubbard is the author of a number of nonfiction books for young adults. While researching her book, African Americans of Chattanooga, A History of Unsung Heroes, she came across the story of Bill Lewis, a blacksmith from Chattanooga. She was greatly moved by his love of family and his determination to overcome the odds. The vibrant illustrations are provided by John Holyfield, who worked with blacksmiths to gain insight into the craft to provide these beautiful illustrations. Enjoy. Hello everyone, Hammering for Freedom, the William Lewis story. One starry night in 1810, William Bill Lewis was born on a plantation in Winchester, Tennessee. Bill and his family were enslaved and worked long, grueling days in Colonel Lewis's fields. Each evening, after the sun had disappeared and had taken all the colors with it, Bill and his mother, aunt, brothers, and sister returned to their little cabin exhausted. Bill watched his mother, Jenny, droop like a wilted flower and lower herself onto a rickety stool to rest. He stood close to comfort her and wished he could do more. As soon as Bill was old enough to grip a hammer, Colonel Lewis decided that the young boy should be a blacksmith. Bill put away tools, swept ashes, and hauled coal and water. Later, he learned to fit hinge joints together, make and repair tools, and work with fire. Bill had not asked to become a blacksmith, but he was very good at it. People paid Colonel Lewis to have Bill fix their broken things. He earned so much money fixing old tools and creating new ones that Colonel Lewis let Bill keep a little money for himself. As Bill's stack of coins grew, so did his hopes and dreams. Each coin he saved brought him closer to purchasing his freedom. Once he was free, he could spend his money on whatever he wanted, and what he wanted was to free his family. Year after year, Bill hammered steel, forged tools, and saved the few coins he was allowed to keep. When he was in his 20s, he married a kind woman named Jane, and a few years later, they had a son named Eldridge. As Bill settled his plump, squirming baby in the crook of his arm, he felt a new weight of responsibility. He would have to work longer and harder if he was going to change his family's circumstances. Bill had been doing more than saving all these years. 
He had also been planning. He knew slave owners often rented out enslaved men and women to make extra money. So Bill decided to ask Colonel Lewis to let him rent himself. If the Colonel agreed, Bill's time would be his own to work day and night as many hours as he could stand until he saved enough to free not only Jane and Eldridge, but also his mother, aunt, brothers, and sister. Colonel Lewis thought carefully about this proposal. He had one condition. Pay me $350 a year to rent your freedom, he said, and you can keep whatever else you earn. Bill agreed. At 27 years old, he set his daring plan into motion. After he paid Colonel Lewis the rent from his savings, Bill still had enough money to open his own blacksmith shop. He chose the perfect location, a bustling little city called Chattanooga that needed a handy blacksmith. Bill packed his tools and his dreams, and with a heavy heart, left Jane, baby Eldridge, and his other family members behind. In 1837, when he opened his shop on Market Street, Bill made history as the first African-American blacksmith in the city. Ding, ching, wearing a thick leather apron to protect against flying sparks, Bill went to work on his first job, the bell and clapper for the little log building sitting right in the middle of town. When the bell sounded, Chattanoogans would know a town meeting was about to begin. Every morning, while the sky was still purple and blue, Bill stretched his muscles and gripped a hammer. Clang, clang! All through the day, his hammer sang its song. The white hot iron spat liquid fire as Bill forged and shaped scythes, mallets, and other instruments, which he sold for 50 cents or one dollar to his many customers. Ding, ching! When other shops closed for the day, Bill kept working. He didn't stop until the burnt orange sky faded to patchy black. Bill was ready for the next step in his plan, buying Jane's freedom. Once Jane was free, any future children she and Bill had would also be free. Bill traveled back to the Lewis plantation with a white escort who would handle the transaction with the colonel. Bill and Jane held their breath as the escort handed over the payment. This makes $1,000, said Colonel Lewis. Jane is free. The expressions on Bill's and Jane's faces did not change in front of the Colonel, but when they were safely home in Chattanooga, they celebrated Jane's freedom. Bill got right back to work. Ding, ching. Bill's workday consisted of more than just fixing old tools. He also created special nails that could be used to secure horseshoes. He sold these for a few pennies each. When he built new wagons that farmers used to haul vegetables, hay, and family members, Bill charged as much as $5.50 per job. People everywhere depended on Bill's calloused, talented hands. After many bone-weary years, Bill returned to Winchester. $1,000, Colonel Lewis announced. Then he placed some papers in Bill's hands. Bill had never learned to read, but he knew what those papers meant. Free, he whispered. I'm free. Still, there was no time to waste. Eldridge is still enslaved, Bill thought. He needed to save his money all over again to buy his son's freedom. Clang, clang, hammer and steel rang out as Bill forged every kind of ax, kitchen tool, and utensil imaginable. Customers came from far and wide to buy what Bill made. Bill returned to Winchester and paid Colonel Lewis $400. Then with a song in his heart, he took Eldridge home to Chattanooga. Ding, ching, clang. Eldridge proudly watched his father plunge 
the sizzling tools deep in the water trough. As he grew, Eldridge arranged the new tools on the wall and helped customers in the shop. Busy as he was, Bill always had time to be a good neighbor. He chatted with customers about the latest news and hired men who needed jobs. He also worshiped in the local Methodist church. The church was segregated, but everyone sang together in songs of praise. Bill's neighbors, his customers, and the members of the congregation grew to love him as an important member of the community. In 1851, Bill paid the Colonel $300, the total asking price for his elderly mother and aunt. His mother, Jenny, and his aunt hurried toward him with open arms. Then Jenny laid her head on Bill's shoulder. Hallelujah, she whispered. They were finally free. Bill wanted to shout with joy, but he noticed his siblings' faces. His sister was wiping away tears. His brothers waved slowly and hung their heads. Bill clenched his jaws with determination. He would simply have to work harder to buy their freedom too. Ding, ching, Bill slung his hammer with such force that his face was drenched with sweat and his chest felt as if it might explode. Somehow, he kept working. Dozens of bluish purple sunrises and burnt orange sunsets passed before he returned to Winchester with $2,000 to buy freedom for his two brothers. When Bill was nearly 50, he and Jane realized they needed a bigger house for their 10 children and extended family. Bill chose a two-story home with lots of bedrooms and a big front porch that the family could enjoy. People were stunned when Bill paid $2,000 in cash for this house. Most white men could not pay that much money for a home in those days. Bill and his family settled in and planted a big vegetable garden. The house was more crowded than ever, but someone was missing. Bill's sister was still enslaved. Bill was much older now than when he first put his plan into action, but he kept on slinging his hammer and saving his money until his sister could finally join them. 26 years after Bill's arrival in Chattanooga, his plan was complete. He had worked, sweated, and prayed. Now he finally had his loving family around him, just like when he was a boy, only now, they were all free. After the reading, teaching artists and local educators were broken into three small groups. Each group would take on either the beginning, the middle, or the end of the story Hammering for Freedom as told by Rita Hubbard. We got together and worked on our scenes, our characters, and how we might imaginatively retell this important story. When the lights went out, it was our turn to perform for our peers, and I must admit it was a lot of fun. It's easy to see the benefits of shadow puppetry as a form of storytelling, as it uses simple ingredients to make a profound impact. On a moonlit night in 1810, on a plantation in Winchester, Tennessee, Aunts, uncles, cousins, brothers, and sisters all gathered round as Bill Lewis was born. <laughs> as Bill Lewis grew up, day after day, he would go to the cotton fields along with his mother and his aunts and uncles and cousins and they would work very hard on the plantation that was owned by Colonel Lewis. Day after day, the family would come back to their cabin and fall exhausted into each other's arms.
Phil saw how hard his family worked. He was so heartbroken. He really wanted to do something to help his family. The very next day, he returned again to the cotton fields, just like he had done all his life and what seemed like would be the rest of his life. The clouds were ominous and they were large and the day just felt dreary. He really worried that there was no hope for change in his life. As the sky got darker, he, re he was warmed. He saw the rays and his heart was warmed as those rays poured down on him. And he saw a path. Bill realized his talent for smithing and the income it could generate. He got a great idea and went to the Colonel. Mr. Lewis, sir. Yes. I know, sir, that other owners rent out their slaves for money, for work. And I was wondering if you would give me permission, sir, would you allow me to rent myself out so that I might make some money of my own? I tell you what, give me $350 for the year and you may keep whatever is left over that you have for yourself. So Bill moved to the bustling city of Chattanooga and opened a blacksmith shop. His first task was to forge the city's bell. Bill's workmanship was celebrated and his shop became very successful. He worked long hours and earned enough to buy his wife's freedom before his own. Back in Chattanooga, Bill and his wife were able to rejoice in their freedom. But still, it is hard to enjoy freedom when leaving something so precious behind. We will get our son and family. It will just take more work. So work, Bill did. Sun up, past sundown. Bill toiled tirelessly to bring his family to freedom. First, he went back for his son. And their little family was at last complete. But still, Bill worked. Dad, you worked so hard. Your feet must be tired and your hands must be aching. When will you rest? My son, I will rest my feet when our family is complete. Join me and we will work together. As the years passed, he continued making trips back to Winchester to purchase freedom for his remaining family members. He wouldn't stop until everyone in his family was free and together. With all the family in his big, fine house, 
he could finally rest his feet because all his family was complete. So I think the power of the arts in educational settings is that what the arts do, whether it's shadow puppetry, whether it's music, whether it's poetry, whether it's dance, is it connects what we're learning up here with what's here. And when we can connect the mind and the heart, we develop citizens that have agency to make change in the world. We hope you enjoyed this special episode of Raise Your Hand. If you decide to take a story from page to stage, let us know. You can follow us on social media or find us at wtcitv.org slash educate. Funding for this lesson was provided by Lyndhurst Foundation.